Lord, Lord, laid all the earth in blood. Does that sound familiar at all? Is there anybody? <laughs> <laughs> That's part of, well, something like part of the Welsh national anthem, which is called in English, Land of My Fathers. In English, land, land, I am true to my land, as long as the sea serves as a wall for this pure, dear land. May the language endure forever. Old land of the mountains, paradise of the poets, every valley, every cliff of beauty guards. Through love of my country, Enchanting voices will be her streams and rivers to me. Uh, the spirit is not hindered by the treacherous hand, nor silenced the sweet harp of my land. Well, I am one quarter Welsh, um, but I can't really say it's the land of my fathers. Well, the land of some of my ancestors. And I can see that in those words, that is a real patriotism, isn't it? That's, that's a real love for your land. I am true to my land. And, the, and, and a Welshman hearing that sang in Welsh, land of my fathers, would have to be stirred, would have to be moved in their emotions. The land of my fathers. Hebrews 11 verse 14 speaks about a homeland. Uh, here in the New King James Version, for those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. What we just read about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, confessing that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth, showing then that they seek a homeland. And the words in the Greek for homeland, it could be translated a land of their fathers, a fatherland fatherland, a place that's home. The word in the Greek can be used for the, the, just a house, your home, or the, the town or village where you were born, where you would consider that you belong. That's the place of your roots. Connect it with your family, your father, or something like that. And it's special to you. And it's dear to you. It's close to, it's close to your heart. And that's what comes across in the Welsh National Anthem. But here it is in a different context in Hebrews. Seeking a fatherland, desiring a fatherland. Hebrews 11 tells us from verse 8 onwards that Abraham was called out of where he once lived. He was called to a place that he didn't really know where to go, but God would show him. And he obeyed and went. And uh, God did show him that place which he was looking for and desiring and believing that God would give it to him. It would be a land flowing with milk and honey. But Abraham wasn't just interested in that place called Canaan. There's something deeper than that which is brought out in Hebrews 11. And we learn about the desire for heaven, for not just a wonderful place on earth, but a city, verse 10, that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So a fatherland, a home, a place to belong, which is special, not least because it is the land of our Heavenly Father. God's place. Somewhere with foundations. That means somewhere with solid immovable foundations that are going to last forever. And may, the, may her language about Wales, may her language endure forever, people say. Her spirit is not hindered or, uh, and, uh, by the treacherous hand and, and, and the sweet harp isn't silenced, but that one day won't be true anymore. But the desire for heaven involves a desire for a place which will last forever. The language will endure forever. Uh, the, the sweet music of it will never be silenced. It has foundations. It will stand. And those who have faith, 
will come to that place. God, verse 16, is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. It's a better country, uh, verse 16. A better, that is a heavenly country, a better homeland, better than you could have here in this world like Wales or like the place that Abraham had belonged to, Ur of the Chaldees or wherever. It's a better place, a heavenly country. And the book of Hebrews is always using that word better. Better. Jesus is better than, than, than the priesthood, than Moses and so on. And there is a homeland, a land of our fathers, which is better than anywhere here. And those who have faith belong there. Those who have faith in the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Those who, like Abraham, obey the Lord. Listen to his voice. Listen to his calling. Come to love God. Come to know that all their future and all their eternity is in the hands of Jesus Christ who died for them to take their sins away. And bless them. Well, we're doing a series on heaven, this place, this better homeland. And the things that I'd like to see now about heaven. Well, I have... I, going to set before you three, three, three more things to say about it, adding to what we've seen already. And we're not going to see much about the last one, but, but we'll continue with these three things next week as well, I, I hope. Heaven is a place of, one, the sweet communion of all the redeemed. Two, tireless activity, <clears throat> which is the service of God, serving God. And then three, perfect rest and refreshment. In this series we're mainly thinking ahead beyond the time when Jesus comes again to what heaven is eternally, forever and ever and ever, after the resurrection of the body. So these three things, the sweet communion of all the redeemed, tireless activity, the service of God, and perfect rest and refreshment. First of all, the sweet communion of all the redeemed. I had that word sweet there. I thought it went well with in the, 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 the words from Wales, the sweet music of the heart. Well, this is the sweet communion of all the redeemed. All the redeemed, all God's people. And um, we read in, in this chapter how Abraham's and Sarah's descendants ultimately became like the stars in the sky and the grains of sand on all the beaches, so many. It's, it's a compa comparison is made with numberless things, vast. And we're talking about a vast number. But sweet communion together, together, friendship, love, sharing, belonging, communion. The end of Hebrews 11 is interesting. Verses 39 and 40. All these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. I don't want to completely attempt to explain these words, but there's a principle here that God loves to leave the best till last and bless all his people together. And um, I think these verses are as much about Jesus himself and the coming of Jesus is about mm. heaven, but we're thinking about heaven and the, the principle is true with heaven. God is going to leave the best till last and then bless all his people together, all of them, every single one of the saved, the redeemed, the chosen, the believers. Bless them all together. And if anyone was missing, it wouldn't be good enough. It would be incomplete, but no one will be missing. And that will be a highlight of this place, this fatherland that we seek, we look forward to, the sweet communion of all the redeemed. It is, after all, called a city, uh, isn't it, in Hebrews 11? City. Abraham looked for a city, city with foundations. God has prepared a city for them. And 
Do we want to think about a city when we think about heaven? Or do we want, would we prefer to think about wide open spaces and uh, beautiful, uh, well, in the, in the Welsh song, it doesn't talk about houses and um, roads. It talks about cliffs and mountains and, uh, and rivers. But the Bible encourages us to think about a city when we think uh, about heaven. We think about cities and we might think about pollution. <laughs> And, and we might think about just everyone being busy, too busy for work for each other, because the pace of life is fast. Um, well, heaven, a city that God will prepare, finish, New Jerusalem, if you like. There'll be no pollution there. You can read Revelation and read about uh Pure gold and clear glass, no dirtiness, no pollution. And there'll be no sense of people are too busy for one another. There's a cold attitude. Um, you're just surrounded by people, but it's every man for himself, like in many cities. It won't be like that. Perhaps we do have some taste for city life. I don't know about you. Some appreciation of a city can feel like the place to be. And I can think of times when I've been in the in the city centre and um, I just appreciate having people around me anyway. But then when you bump into someone you know, it can be a very special thing, a nice thing. Oh, bumped into so-and-so and, and then I saw so-and-so as well. And uh, just a nice surprise. It's really nice. And, uh, and, and they were shopping and we, we had a bit of time, so we... We just went to such and such a place together, whatever. Um, so we could perhaps we have some appreciation that city life can can have its have its pleasures uh, and its social pleasures, and certainly that is what we can think of with regard to the the Jerusalem to come, being part of the new Jerusalem, being together. David in Psalm 122 speaks about Jerusalem and he loves Jerusalem and he says, for, for my brethren and companions' sake. He's, I'm surrounded by brothers and companions in Jerusalem. In Matthew uh, chapter 8, verse 11, we read this. Jesus said, I say to you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Many will come from east and west, and they'll all sit down, and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, recline with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It will be a city where you sit down together, you enjoy being with one another, even though you're all from different parts of the world in the kingdom of heaven. We read in 1 Corinthians 13 about love, didn't we? beauty of love, Christian love, and we read love never ends. We read now continue, now abide these three things, faith, hope and love. But the greatest of these is love. It's the greatest thing out of faith, hope and love, which is going to endure forever. And the, the, the city to come, the homeland that we're seeking as Christians is a place of love, perfect love. Love makes it special. Love Love gives it its characteristic, a place of pure love everywhere. One of the reasons that we Christians can be harsh towards one another sometimes, we can be critical, can't we? We can be cold-hearted towards other Christians. We can write other Christians off. One of the reasons for that is because we don't always really believe that we're going to be in heaven together. We're heading for that. We'll all be together in heaven. Matthew preached last Sunday morning about, uh, was it two Sundays ago, about the death of uh, Saul and Jonathan and how David mourned his best friend, Jonathan, and how he'd said that that friendship and love was wonderful. David and Jonathan, they found out that one of the best things in life is companionship. Your heart being knit together with someone else. 
And yet many of the circumstances of David and Jonathan's friendship were difficult, weren't they? And then David has to mourn Jonathan. He's died before his time. Well, David and Jonathan are going to be together along with so many others. And there'll be nothing difficult or trying or grievous about the circumstances. Together, perfectly, along with along with so many others. Joseph in the Old Testament will be able to sit down next to Joseph, the father, or the, the husband of Mary in the New Testament. The two Josephs, separated by thousands of years, they'll be able to talk together. Um, I think about Abraham and, no I don't, I think about Paul and Isaiah. Paul loved to quote Isaiah. Paul loved Isaiah. And yet, he never knew Isaiah. But they're both in heaven. And in the, in the resurrection, in the new heavens and the new earth, Paul and Isaiah will talk and enjoy being together in the city. We might say perhaps they'll be next door neighbours, but silly thing to say because I don't want to talk about it as having a next door neighbour when we don't know the details, how life will work. But think of Paul and Isaiah together and not just these people in the Bible, but as well as being able to talk with Abraham and Paul and Joseph and Joseph, we'll be able to talk with, just throw some names out, fuck some names out of my mind, Mr. Charles Spurgeon, Mrs. Susanna Spurgeon, George Muller, Corrie Ten Boone, all together. And so many unknown, unfamous believers who yet have been wonderful believers and have been faithful to the Lord. And thousands and thousands all together and all made perfect in the city of God. The sweet communion of all the redeemed. Sweet communion. If love is precious now, which it is, friendship can be wonderful now, as, Jonathan, as David said about Jonathan, which it can be, then this will be no small part of the joys of heaven, the sweet communion of all the redeemed. But then two more things, tireless activity. It will be a place of tireless activity, and it will be a place of perfect rest and refreshment. What will all these people do? What will we all do? What will, what will daily life do? in the city look like well there will be activity there just quote from al martin now uh, you know that al martin is a an american preacher from new jersey and i've been um uh, using quite a lot of what he says as my general points in this series well he says no little part of that service the service of god in heaven no little part will be the abandoned worship and adoration of our great God. The abandoned worship and adoration of our great God. Can we turn, if you, if you wish to, to Revelation chapter 4, the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 4 from verse 8. Revelation chapter 4 from verse 8. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. 
Now, there's living creatures here in this vision and there's 24 elders. And I think they're both talking about angels, different types or different classes of angels. Would you think it's a good thing, a desirable thing to be an angel? And going from this passage, is this happiness or is this um, tedious, tedious stuff, unappealing stuff? Or is this a wonderful thing? Just all the time. Well, certainly it's, de it's, it's describing something which happens again and again and again. Whenever the living creatures give glory, the 24 elders fall down. Uh, and it's a falling down in worship, isn't it? Uh, so you think of it as an angel. You've got a crown because God has given you a crown. But you want to cast that crown. You want to say, it's not really mine. It's yours. Holy, holy, holy. It's the, it's the holy God's crown. It's his. And you fall down. You just, just you want to be nothing, really. Or, or that's what your, your body is saying. I'm nothing. Uh, but I'm just lost in, this, in the presence of someone I'm overwhelmed by, a glorious and a wonderful God. I'm moved by his love to you, and, and then you, you're full of love to him. Does that kind of thing appeal? I remember talking to someone, well, it was talking over the internet on, a, on some discussion, and, and he said, well, I must say, the Muslims have got a better idea of heaven than you Christians have. I, I much prefer the thought of, and, and you can think of the 72 virgin maidens that you might get if you're a martyr in Islam. Uh, and he said, that, 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 that's a much better idea of what, 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 what you could call heaven. The reason he said that is because he had no taste for a pleasure which is higher and greater than the pleasures described by what you get as a martyr in Islam and, and things like that. Sensual pleasures that are just about what we can relate to in this life in our bodies. He had no taste for something which was which you have, to, you have to be given by God an appetite for. You have to realise it is actually the, the highest and greatest thing to do, to worship God and what Al Martin calls abandoned worship so and adoration. Abandoned, so this falling down, this casting your crowns. I think the word abandoned goes quite well with that, abandoning yourself um, in praise to God. Al Martin goes on to say this. Let me read this. This is something I could relate to. He said, is that all the service we will render? In other words, in this city, all the, all the redeemed having sweet communion together. But is this really all their activity? Is it about singing, falling down, casting crowns, etc., etc.? He says, I can remember a time when I didn't even dare to express to anyone for fear they would think me a blasphemer, that there was something in me that didn't get too excited at the thought of doing nothing but worshipping and adoring. The sense of the creative, the desire to accomplish the aesthetic sensitivities, all of those things that mark us out of image bearers of God. And I said, Lord, forgive me for even thinking it, and I didn't dare breathe this to a soul for fear I would be thought heretic or half apostate or some other tragic and terrible thing. But if I find in my moments of greatest joy here and now, if I find my moments of greatest joy here and now when I'm actively serving you, and that's the fruit of grace, then surely something of that will be carried on into the world to come. And now Martin goes on to describe how he, he then grew in his understanding of the Bible and, and realised, no, there is, there is some very varied ways in which the service of God will happen in the new creation. I, I remember hearing of my a grandfather that I have that I never met, my, my, my dad's dad, and how he said to Pastor Hawkins, uh, the, the, the pastor in Watterson, where he was very faithful, he said, in a similar way to Martin, I'm sorry to say it, but 
I, I hope this is okay, but I feel like I'd much rather plough a field for God than play a harp for him in heaven. Uh, we're going to think about more to that, more of that next week. The, 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 what the Bible says about the activity in heaven of serving God. But no small part of it will be the abandoned worship and adoration of God. And that will be wonderful. That will be wonderful. And we can turn on from Revelation chapter 4 about the angels worshipping God for creation to Revelation 7. Revelation 7, because yes, Revelation talks about the praise to God in heaven from the beginning of creation. God worshipped for creation by the angels, but it goes on to speak of God being worshipped even more for salvation, for the blood of Jesus Christ, for, for Jesus giving himself and dying for us, for all that happened on the cross, for, for Jesus washing our sins away by taking them on himself and giving us who without grace would head for hell, would be in hell, giving us eternal, wonderful, abundant life, making us children of God. The praise for that will exceed the praise for creation. And human beings will praise in a way that the angels can't. Well, Revelation 7 and uh, verse 9. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, people, and tongues. This is the redeemed, the, the great number, the full number of the redeemed, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four mm -hmm. living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honour and power and might be to our God for ever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who's are the, Who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Praise to God. It starts off by this Christ, salvation belongs to our God. And then this passage finishes with the, the surroundings, not just praising God, but praising God in a context where there's no hunger or thirst, no need to take a lunch break, no need to wear sun cream, the sun shall not strike them nor any heat, and the relationship with the Lord being not one of only praising him, but still receiving from him. The Lamb, the Lord Jesus, who is in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters. Tireless activity, the service of God, and perfect rest and refreshment. We'll have to come back to this passage another time. I want to say more about it uh, next week. But this is, this is a better fatherland, isn't it? This is better than Wales. This is the fatherland of the redeemed. Can we feel a loyalty to this land? Can we feel this is where our citizenship is? This is where our heart is. Like Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, desiring, let us do that. Let us desire a better country, a better homeland, a better city, where you have the sweet communion of all the redeemed, tireless activity in the service 
of God. Being busy, but not getting tired or hungry. Having perfect rest and refreshment, but glad to be busy in the service of God, who, who is the builder and maker, who is the Father, who makes it the fatherland. We're going to have a closing hymn, which, if you, if, if, um, Land of My Fathers could be thought of as um, all about Wales and the, 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 the song which epitomises the beauty of Wales, or well, maybe this closing hymn could be thought of as something a bit like a national anthem for heaven. Jerusalem the golden, with milk and honey blessed, beneath thy contemplation sink heart and voice oppressed. I know not, oh I know not what holy joys are there. 